engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Worst point decline in history. The Dow plunges 1,175. The the hysteria from the media over the Dow plunging 1,175 points today. It can only plunge 1,175 points because it's gotten so high in the last year. Uh, Y'all, listen, there's a lot of fear being reported in the media today. Welcome, by the way, it's Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. It is now almost 10 after the hour here. This is such a, a, a sensationalized story. Yes, it is true. It is the largest point drop in the Dow Jones. The only reason it could do that is because it got above um, 25,000. Now, on Friday, it went down 665 points. Today, it went down 1,175 points. But uh, forget forget the point drop because the point drop is meaningless. You need to know the percentage drop. The percentage drop is what's key. And today the Dow dropped 4.6%. On Friday it dropped 2.5%. So roughly 7 percentage points over 2 days the Dow dropped. In the grand scheme of things, that puts Friday and today at number 19 for the worst Dow point drop. But Neither Friday nor today is in the top 20. In fact, neither Friday nor today are in the top 25 of percentage points lost in the Dow. I mean, the percentage loss again for today, 4.6%. The worst percentage drop in the Dow ever, a 22% decline, was in 1987 when it dropped 508 points. You want to know the Dow, just for perspective, for why percentages don't matter? The Dow only dropped 508 points in 1987, but that amounted to 22% of the value of the Dow being wiped out. Yes, today the Dow Jones has gone up so much, it looks like a huge number, 1,175 points lost, but that only amounts to a decrease in the value of the Dow of 4.6%. I mean, or, or go back to 1933. The Dow lost seven points in 1933. That was a 7.7% decline. The, 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 just the hysteria here, the, the relying on the, the number change, on the point loss, distorts the picture. This was not a significant drop in the Dow Jones. It doesn't even rank in the top 25 losses in the Dow Jones. So just, uh, I would say, relax, relax. If you want an even better contrast here, in December, or October 13th of 2008, the Dow went up 936 points, 936 points. And in 2008, a 936 point change amounted to a change in 11% of the Dow. The stock market has gone up so much since then that now a 1,175 point change only amounts to a 4.6% change in the stock market. So everybody calm down. Just calm down. It's not that dramatic. The number looks big. The percentage, not even in the top 25 losses. By the way, one last point on this before I move on to FISA. In 2008, a 4.6% gain or loss of the Dow would have amounted to to 413 points, 413 points. It is a measure of the growth and robustness of the American economy that 1,175 points is only a 4.6% change in the Dow. That's a good thing. Now, I got to get to the FISA. First of all, my apologies not being here Friday with such a big news day uh, on tap regarding the FISA memo. Uh, The stomach bug swept through the Erickson household. I got home from doing the Brian Kemp interview Thursday night late at 2 a.m. woke up to the sounds of of stomach bugs spreading among my wife and kids and I was on nurse duty Thursday and Friday I did not get it myself I thought I was going to get it I felt terrible 
overnight Friday into Saturday, but never actually got as bad as they were. Um, but I, that's why I wasn't here on Friday. Tomorrow, I am going to interview Michael Williams and Hunter Hill. We're going to do them live on air. I'm going to do four hours tomorrow night. I'll do five to seven of the regular show and the interviews from seven to nine. And then on Thursday night, uh, Casey Cagle, uh, we're rescheduling the Clay Tippins event. I'll let you know. On the FISA memo, can I just mention the irresponsibility of the situation first? And I don't mean this um, negatively per se, but there's an issue here no one's talking about. We've got Congressman Nunez, Conway, King, Lobiondo, Rooney, Roslathan, Turner, Winstrup, Stewart, Gowdy, Stefanik, and Hurd. Those are the Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee. They represent... California, Texas, New York, New Jersey, Florida, Ohio, Utah, and South Carolina. And they have released a memo alleging that partisans within the Department of Justice and the FBI went to a FISA court and played politics, leaving out information. They did not lie, and this is a key here, this is a key point that's being mis- misreported. There were no lies to the FISA court. What they were, though, were misrepresentations. They were misrepresentations because they were not lies. They were intentionally leaving out information. The information that they left out was that the FISA application for Carter Page was based on a dossier prepared by Christopher Steele on behalf of the Democratic campaign of Hillary Clinton through a third-party group, Fusion GPS. According to the memo from Devin Nunez, Andrew McCabe, the deputy director of the FBI, testified under oath before his committee that no FISA application would have ever been filed but for the Christopher Steele dossier. And no one told the FISA court that the dossier was bought and paid for by Democratic operatives. It was a partisan compilation that the FBI was relying on. No one ever told the FISA court that Christopher Steele who prepared the dossier, was on record saying he opposed the election of Donald Trump and would do whatever he could to stop Donald Trump from getting elected. That's in the Devin Nunes memo. All of that information was withheld from the FISA court. The FISA court was led to believe, not through lies, but through the failure to provide information, the FISA court was led to believe that the FBI had compiled all of this research on its own related to the initial counterintelligence investigation to George Papadopoulos. So why do I bring up those 12 members of the Intelligence Committee? Because the 12 members of the Intelligence Committee have their names now associated with going on record saying that the Obama administration politicized the FISA application process. The Obama administration withheld crucial information to a FISA court in order to get the court to do what the administration wanted done. So I have to ask a question. If these 12 members of Congress are going on record acknowledging that the FISA process has become contaminated by the political interests of an administration, why did these 12, and Nunes in particular, push for Congress to reauthorize the FISA application process? If the process got that contaminated, why are they willing to reauthorize it without pausing it to examine how to get the politics out of it. That seems really irresponsible to me. Y'all, just let me interrupt here for a sponsor because this one is actually really cool and I'm really excited about them. This is mancrates.com. Now, Valentine's Day is coming up. And you may have a significant other. You may be the significant other and you're thinking, I don't want that crap for Valentine's Day. I, I don't want flowers. I don't want chocolate. Uh, Good Lord, I I want something manly for Valentine's Day. Well, man crates, either on behalf of your significant other or direct the one who will be buying it for you. 
to mancrates.com. I mean, you actually get a, a physical crate of stuff. You can get NFL barware. You can get the whiskey appreciation crate. You can get the beef jerky heart for, I mean, or the salami bouquet for Valentine's. All sorts of, it even comes with a crowbar, by the way. This is really cool stuff. Thousands of five-star reviews. <laughs> so they sent me uh, custom engraved pint glasses for beer. Or whatever, mine will be for beer. But nonetheless, you can put you can put water in them if you want to. No, they're actually really good, good quality stuff. Really fun gift to get too because it's a great crate. So what you got to do is you got to go to mancrates dot com, m a n c r a t e s dot com slash eric e r i c k. Don't forget the c k, and you'll get five percent off. Now they don't offer a discount anywhere else. But you can get 5% off right now at mancrates.com slash Eric, mancrates.com slash Eric. But, 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 remember, it's mancrates.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. Really is awesome. Beer glasses, salami, you name it. Uh, you can get a outdoors gear. It's just awesome selection. Go to mancrates.com slash Eric for 5% off. Check it off now. A great Valentine's Day gift, maybe even for yourself. <laughs> It's 25 after the hour. Don't forget, if you want the show notes or the podcast, you can text the word show to 444-999, and I will get you back the link um, for all of it. Now, have you, you guys know who Rose McGowan is. I assume she was a TV actress. Um, she, she's a flaky liberal, but she's one of the flaky liberals who exposed Harvey Weinstein. And the left heralded... Rose McGowan as a hero for being brave enough to expose the sins of Harvey Weinstein. And then, of course, she was outraged that she wasn't invited to the Golden Globes after she took the heroic step of exposing Harvey Weinstein, but she wasn't invited because she wasn't in any movie. And people tend to forget that to be invited to the Golden Globes, you got to have an association with a present TV show or movie. Um, and, but she really made it about herself. Now, several people I know who know her say that she's kind of like this, um, and was, looks for publicity. Well, she's got a new book out and was in New York city reading from her book and a transgender activist began berating her for her position on transgender folks. The, the guy who thinks he's a woman, I was upset with Rose McGowan for having an interview, I believe, with RuPaul, uh, saying that she didn't think that men who become women have walked in the shoes of women completely and so can't fully relate, and that uh, feminism and, and women's rights uh, are bigger than transgender rights or somewhat different from. And the trans activist was heckling her. They got into a knockdown drag, a yell, yelling, screaming match. You will not be surprised to learn that the Women's March, the people who organized the pink-clad rally against Donald Trump, they've sided with the patriarchy. That's right. They're coming out in support of the man, Andy Dyer, although he spells his name with an I and dresses like a woman. Um, they have taken Andy Dyer's side and, and said Rose McGowan should be ashamed of herself for, for her transphobic remarks. Never mind that she was a hero a couple of weeks ago for the Harvey Weinstein stuff. These people are eating their own over this stuff. Well, now it turns out that this trans activist is being accused by three different women of sexual assault when they were 13 years old. Uh, all three of them claimed that this person assaulted them. So not only is the Women's March taking the side of a man against the woman who helped bring down Harvey Weinstein, but they're taking the side of a man now accused of sexual assault, and they're saying nothing about that. Because, of course, because that that's, that's I mean, the, this whole feminist movement like that, it's just, a, it's a racket. It's a scam, and they eat their own. That's why they will never long-term be successful. Thirty-eight after the hour. Eric Erickson here. News ninety-five five AM seven fifty WSB. The phone number four zero four eight seven two zero seven five zero one eight hundred 
WSB Talk. A, a little more on the FISA memo since I went here on, on Friday. This is good news for President Trump, even under the worst case scenario. In the worst case scenario, the scenario the Democrats believe, the FBI has been investigating his campaign. And they've been investigating him, <clears throat> excuse me, him colluding with the Russians. In the worst case scenario reading of the Devin Nunez memo, it's not a criminal investigation of the president. It's a counterintelligence investigation against Russia. George Papadopoulos is the key here. In a drunken night at a bar in London, he, a volunteer for the Trump campaign, claiming to be a, a foreign policy advisor, uh, told the Australian ambassador the Russians had information that would take down Hillary Clinton. The Australian ambassador tipped off his counterpart to the U.S. who began a counterintelligence investigation of Russia. George Papadopoulos cut a deal with the Mueller investigators to say what he knew. But it's counterintelligence. When Carter Page, let's say in the worst case scenario, Carter Page had a FISA warrant issued against him because of George Papadopoulos and their connection. Now, Nunez says that Andrew McCabe testified it was only because of the Steele dossier, but there's other language in the memo that suggests actually his ties to George Papadopoulos may have in, uh, caused the warrant to proceed. Well, if that's the case, they got the warrant in October of 2016 after Carter Page was done with the Trump campaign. He wasn't even there anymore. So we know that the investigation is looking at Paul Manafort from a time he wasn't with the Trump campaign and now is looking at Carter Page from a time he wasn't with the Trump campaign. So how does this hurt the president? I have a hard time seeing how this hurts the president in the worst case scenario. In the most favorable scenario, it, it was partisan motivated a partisan-motivated witch hunt by the Democrats. Uh, the problem is that Rod Rosenstein at the Department of Justice, some Republicans wanted to use this memo to discredit him, but Rosenstein was put in his place by the Bush administration. Uh, then the Obama administration kept him, and the Trump administration has elevated him to d uh, deputy AG. He's highly respected by both sides. And it looks like he was kept out of the loop on the Steele dossier. He was not made aware of all of the details of the Steele dossier uh, as they headed to the FISA court. So it, it's really hard to blame him. But he did keep things going, the investigation going, uh, with Carter Page based on what was uncovered in his examination of Carter Page, which suggests there's a larger investigation into Russian influence in the American election that really had nothing to do with Donald Trump. Remember, they wanted to sow chaos in the election, according to the Obama administration. It's not that they wanted to help Donald Trump. And this memo corroborates the claims of the Obama administration, not the claims of hysterical Democrats claiming Trump stole the election with the help of the Russians. I don't think this memo does what some of the Republicans wanted it to do, though, which was to provide a basis to shut down the Mueller investigation. Even Trey Gowdy has come out this weekend and said he respects Robert Mueller and thinks that investigation needs to go keep going, um, that it is separate from this memo. So that, to a degree, hurts the Trump team, uh, that you have Gowdy coming out, who's highly respected by conservatives on this issue, saying that that investigation is separate and should keep going. Um, now... I want to spend the next hour on local issues. We'll get into the Super Bowl, some of the ads as well. There's an ad if you're in Atlanta, you did not hear the ad, but it's a Georgia ad about Georgia politics, and I do want to get into that now. So Thursday night at 8, we were going to interview Clay Tippins. Uh, he had a scheduling conflict he did not realize, and he could not be there until 8.30, uh, which would have only given us 30 minutes. I wanted to do a full hour with all the candidates, and so we're going to reschedule his interview. So if you got a ticket to the Clay Tippins event, don't show up Thursday night looking for it. We will do uh, Casey Cagle at 7. Uh, we will find another time for Clay Tippins. But outside of Atlanta... During the Super Bowl last night, uh, his campaign ran their first commercial, an introduction to him. Georgia. Oh, hey, I got to rewire the audio, don't I? Genius. Here we go. Clay Tippins, his ad last night. Uh, Georgia Clay is the title of the ad. Georgia's Clay Tippins likes to swim, was nation's top high school swimmer. Swimming scholarship to Stanford won three national championships. 
Clay's opponents for Georgia governor also swim. Clay's mission-focused upbringing led him to becoming a Navy SEAL, served his years, volunteered for more. Clay's opponents watch SEALs. Clay returned home to high tech where he built a multinational $500 million business. Clay's opponents also have business experience. Georgia is the greatest state in America, but why can't all of our children read? Why is Atlanta still the sex trafficking capital of the country? Why are we still running government pretty much the same way we did 50 years ago? A 21st century Georgia needs a 21st century governor. He's no politician. He's real. Georgia's conservative Republican, Clay Tippins. So, you know, there seems to be, you obviously can't see it in the ad, but there seems to be a real dig at Casey Cagle um, above and beyond the other candidates because he's taking the David Purdue track. Remember the David Purdue ad uh, that all the other candidates, they're crying babies, career politicians who can't get anything done. That's kind of the, the angle that Tippins has taken in this ad. Uh, but all of the other candidates in there are shown uh, dressed in standard uh, charcoal gray suits, except for the one they found a guy who looks kind of like Casey Cagle with the glasses, the short cropped hair, and he's wearing a powder blue tuxedo from the 70s with ruffles throughout the advertisement. Uh, there's a swimming scene. There's there's a looks like a hunting scene. And then there's a scene with him being a tailor, which is kind of a dig. Uh, Casey has run a, a side business, I guess you could say, and of ties and whatnot. But it's just it, it, it's noticeable that Cagle is the guy he seems to be targeting more in the ad. What I also find interesting is he makes human trafficking a, a centerpiece of this. Now, it, Tippins apparently, and, and I, I do want to ask him about this. He's apparently the guy who the one candidate who says he he won't sign a religious liberty uh, bill in the if it were to come through the state legislature, he's not in favor of it. And I, I, it's an interesting juxtaposition from that to he he's making sex trafficking a big issue in his campaign, uh, which would be an interesting way to galvanize some evangelical support for him while also not supporting RIFRA, uh, which is a big issue. And it, it's nice to see candidates running for statewide office in Georgia calling out this issue because I don't think it gets enough attention in the state. Um, it is a huge issue. You know, when I ran for city council in Macon, it was the only issue I ran on because human trafficking in middle Georgia has been really, really bad. And we were able to get a lot of the Asian themed massage parlors in the area that were serving as fronts for human trafficking shut down. Um, and I just, it really stood out to me in his commercial last night. I also find it very interesting. He didn't run that ad in Atlanta. If you're, if you're listening to this program right now and you were watching, uh, an Atlanta area NBC affiliate, you did not see that ad last night. Would have been too expensive for his campaign. Uh, but they ran it throughout the rest of the state, uh, in middle Georgia and south Georgia and along the coast in the Columbus area. They ran that ad trying to introduce him to the voters. Um, I just The sex trafficking and the Casey Cagle lookalike uh, really stand out. So go look for that ad if you want. I'll push it out on Twitter. It's 55 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. We'll get into local stuff when we come back. The legislature is meeting. Updates on the adoption bill, updates on the school choice legislation as well, and we'll get into Super Bowl ads. However, I will just say this here. Uh, YouTube has just released its metrics for the most watched Super Bowl ads from last night. Five of the top ten are for other entertainment. Um, Therefore, movies or TV shows. You got... um, at number five, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan from Amazon Prime. Number six, Solo, a Star Wars story. Yes. Number seven, Westworld Season 2. Number eight, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Number nine, uh, Marvel's Avengers Infinity Wars. Yeah. Uh, number one is Alexa Loses Her Voice. And I got to say, the, the Alexa ad just reminds me of how much more creepy Alexa could be. Um, the, the Amazon echo device, uh, it, you, they it can already eavesdrop on you. And some of them have cameras now. Um, and the, the Amazon and Google, they don't have the privacy settings like Apple does its device, by the way, it's coming out on Friday. Um, it's home, like, I guess you could call it echo or Google home competitor. 
Um, I just, some of these things give me the heebie-jeebies. I don't, I wouldn't want Google with an open mic in my house, given the way they disrespect my privacy online. Um, and, and Amazon is, is a little bit creepy that way too, when it comes to that. But in any event, when we come back, let's move into local stuff. Uh, the latest play by play in the legislature as they continue to meet in Atlanta, hashing out the budget, school choice, adoption reform, and so much more. As promised, welcome back, by the way. It's Eric Erickson here. As promised, I want to spend some time on state issues. Uh, First, to bring you up to speed, um, the Georgia Senate has um, passed the House of Representatives HB 159. That's the adoption reform bill. They passed it 53 to 2. The House agreed to leave in Casey Cagle's provision that would allow essentially private foster care through churches, uh, a big win for churches in the state. Meanwhile, the Senate agreed to the House provision that would allow um, reimbursement of birth mothers' living expenses for items like rent, groceries, maternity clothes, uh, shorten the time allowed for a birth mother to change her mind and, and from 10 days to four and allow power of attorney for a child to be transferred. Um, so e- big compromise on the issue. They left out the core provision on religious liberty for faith-based adoption agencies participating in the state foster care program, which is problematic for sure. It's been introduced uh, by William Ligon in a separate piece of legislation. I'm sure the governor will veto it because the governor seems to oppose religious liberty protection. But uh, it was a win in that faith-based adoption groups and churches will be able to participate in the foster care system. Now, this should be a real red flag, I think, for the state when it comes to these situations that we have in our state a lot of churches, uh, North Point, Andy Stanley's church is a great example of this, that have taken a very pro-life position of helping birth mothers through the church find loving homes for kids in situations where the family cannot take care of the child in temporary circumstances. They're not operating as a full adoption. They're operating as a foster care system where someone can go to a church or another family-oriented group, and through a power of attorney process, sign over the care of their children for up to a year so that someone else can take care of the child. There's no evidence the system has been abused. It's used in other states, but bureaucrats in Georgia, not elected officials, bureaucrats in Georgia put their foot down and said, absolutely not. They've got to use the state foster care system. There was no law that specifically prohibited faith-based groups from doing what they were doing, but the bureaucrats in Georgia decided that they weren't going to be allowed to do it. So this compromise led by Casey Cagle and members of the Senate was passed, and the governor vetoed it last time around, um, but is now, it looks like he's going to be okay with it this time around, allowing churches to do these things which is good. It is a real win for faith-based pro-life groups in the state of Georgia that this went through, and the Senate should be committed for going along with it. I understand the reservations of some in the Senate, led by State Senator David Schaefer, about reimbursing birth mothers for their expenses while pregnant. I get that, but 47 other states do it, and I think it was a reasonable compromise to go along with the House and do that. Uh, the adoption bill now heads to the governor for her passage. It passed unanimously in the House, 53 to 2 in the Senate. Uh, and the governor apparently is now going to sign it, even with that provision related to private foster care in churches. Good. Now, I want to talk about a piece of legislation making its way very slowly through the House of Representatives That not only do I hope you'll support, but I hope you'll take action to get the state legislature to support. And that is House Bill 482, the Georgia Educational Scholarship Act. Wes Cantrell in the state house has authored this piece of legislation. Uh, There's a growing movement of states that have adopted uh, educational scholarship accounts. They're different from the so-called education savings account to a degree education scholarship accounts, Uh, Arizona, Florida, Mississippi, Nevada, Tennessee, North Carolina um, have them right now. 
and a dozen other states are considering them, and it looks like Georgia will, like so many other things, be left behind if they don't do this, but it would really, really help uh, a lot of poor people in the state and their kids in failing schools. There are only about 15,000 students who would participate nationwide, who do participate nationwide in this. And in Georgia, the way it would work, it would be limited to one quarter of 1% of total public school enrollment. That's about 4,500 students statewide the first year. And it would escalate a quarter of 1% each year thereafter, expanding the pool slowly over time. So if things did come up administratively, uh, there would be plenty of time to catch them. But who would qualify for this? Students with family incomes below 200,000 or 200,000, 200 percent of the federal poverty level, which is forty nine thousand two hundred dollars. Students adopted from foster care, students whose parents are active duty military, students with disability, students with a documented case of bullying against them and students who have spent the previous year enrolled in a Georgia public school, although there would be priority on the first five Uh, And those uh, kids could only then come into the program based on spending time in public school the prior year if the others hadn't filled up the program. Now, what does this do? Well, you know, when a kid is in public school in the state, money flows from the state to the school for that child's benefit. If the child leaves the school, the state no longer sends the money to that school. It goes to the new school. Well, right now under state law, if the child leaves a public school and goes to a private school, the money just doesn't go anywhere from the state. If the child goes from public school into a homeschooling situation, doesn't go anywhere. Or if the child goes from public school and is academically gifted and winds up taking college programs, the the money stays in the local school or it doesn't go anywhere. So what HB um, 482 would do, it would allow parents to control that state money if they leave their public school and go to a different school. So, for example, if the parents decided to withdraw their child from a failing public school and move their child to a private school, the money would follow the child to the private school to help offset the cost of tuition. If the child moved into a homeschool setting, it would allow the parents to offset the cost of homeschool materials. Or if the child moved into a college setting because they're they're academically gifted, it would help offset those funds as well. There would be strict controls on the account, and by the way, the students would still have to undergo standardized testing to make sure they were getting the education their parents claimed they're getting. So some people would not want to do this because they would not want to deal with the state regulation, and I get that. The question is, should we preclude all parents from being able to benefit from this? Because there are some parents who would love to take advantage of this to get their kid out of a failing uh, public school. And we're precluding any parent from being able to take advantage of this because some people don't want to. And of course, there are teachers unions and whatnot who are opposed to any sort of school choice and oppose any sort of recognition that some public schools are failing. All they want is more money for the public school. Here's the thing, though, again, If you take your child out of a public school, that money that flows from the state to the school for your child disappears. If you send your kid to another public school, it goes there. If you send your kid to a private school, the money just disappears. Why not let the parents use that money to help offset their child's education and give their child a good education? This is a great way to provide school choice without all sorts of onerous, burdensome requirements. And the parents would have certain safeguards so they wouldn't be able to steal or waste the money. It is a great compromise, I think, for school choice. I hope you'll agree with me. And if you're willing and able, text the word HOPE to 52886 right now. Text the word HOPE to 52886 right now. The Resurgence Action Center is open. You'll be able to generate an email, tweet, and Facebook message to members of the State House urging them to pay attention to and support this legislation to get them behind the Educational Scholarship Act, HB 482. So text the word HOPE to 52886, and maybe we can help out some parents whose kids are in failing public schools across the state. Y'all, listen, I I can't make it easier for you. 
I got a, an angry text message from someone saying that I was uh, I, angry text message. I got an angry email from someone saying I was encouraging people to text while drive. I'm not. If you're driving and texting, you shouldn't be. But if you are at home, if you're listening somewhere, if you are in a standstill on 285 and you're the passenger in a car, you can text. It's just drivers need to be paying attention to the road. I'm not trying to encourage people to text and drive. The It's crazy what some people get outraged by these days. Uh, what I am trying to get you to do, though, is to help some common sense school choice reform in Georgia. Um, there are a lot of people, that, by the way, West Control's legislation, I, I failed to mention in, in the first segment, um, that it has bipartisan support, HB 482. It's before the appropriate committees right now, though, and it is uh, some of the committee members are so overwhelmed with other tasks and things, they haven't spent a lot of time paying attention to it. And a lot of the good issues in the legislature I've found over time require uh, voter education towards their state representatives and senators to just make them aware that, hey, this is a good piece of legislation. You may not know about it, but we do, and we'd like you to support it. And a lot of legislation falls by the wayside because there are no voter advocates for the legislation. And if nothing else, one of the things I like to do with this program is to encourage you guys to participate in the process and to make it easy for you with the text action program. Now, by the way, if you text the word hope to 52886 and you go through the process, you are going to get a thank you email back from me. uh, And it's going to request if you would consider uh, giving a donation for the action center. I've been paying for these, this action center we use here on our, our show for the last couple of years out of pocket. I can't anymore. And if I don't get enough support from folks, um, we're probably going to have to turn it off. And that's that's not to shake you down. It's just to tell you the truth. With medical bills and everything else, it becomes more and more of a burden every year for me to pay for this thing out of pocket. Um, but I hope you will support this great legislation. Again, text the word HOPE to eight uh, to rather 52886, the word HOPE to 52886. And let's see if we can get some good school choice reform passed in Georgia. All righty now. It's Eric Erickson here, 39 after the hour. The phone number, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. It is time to talk about the Super Bowl. I did not expect Philadelphia to win. Now, you should know that I don't particularly care much about the NFL. I like college sports more, and I realize all my friends who are huge NFL fans talk about how much better the games are, the, the play, the action, everything. I get it. But I'm still more of a college guy. I I like the fact that the college athletes aren't making billions of dollars to win or lose a game. Uh, And they're desperate to be in the NFL, many of them. And uh, they're just, they're playing their hearts out. I I like, I I like college football. Uh, I like college sports generally better than professional football. Although I I do pay attention to it. Listen, um, I like the Falcons and I grew up in Louisiana. I am required to root for Mannings. It's in my blood. And I'm required to root for the Saints. I was not required to root for the Patriots or the Eagles. And I was fairly well bought into the media narrative that that Tom Brady was going to be dominant and he was going to win because it's the Patriots. And I don't think anyone, in, in fact, I noticed there were several polls that like even Eagles fans who wanted the Eagles to win, uh, less than 10% of them thought that the Eagles actually would win. So it, it was a real upset last night uh, to that degree in that the Eagles beat the Patriots, but it it was a good game. And I feel like the, yeah, and this is a feel, it's not a think. I I feel like the Falcons have been avenged by the Eagles. And there's some poetic justice there that a bird mascot has beaten the Patriots this time. There are just a couple of things I want to note. First of all, I found it distasteful for Hyundai to sell cars based on fighting childhood cancer. I I didn't like that. I I really, really didn't like that uh, that Hyundai decided to go that route. Um, It it just, it it strikes me as bad form. Listen, we spent a lot of time here at WSB raising money to fight childhood cancers. Uh, We believe in the cause, but we don't add it as a tagline that, um, oh, you should support us and listen to us because 
we fight child, we raise money to fight childhood cancer. And it just, it left a bad taste in my mouth. In the same way, um, look, Martin Luther King's um, speech that was in the Dodge commercial, his sermon, is my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. sermon. It really is. I played the audio on this show before. And that, again, I thought was distasteful to put Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech in a commercial like that. It would be one thing if it was a commercial like, like for example, the Anheuser-Busch commercial where they focused on bottling water to get to hurricane victims. Um, that I thought would have been appropriate because they they were focusing. It wasn't a, a buy our beer because we do this. It was just a, this is this is one of the things we do. Now, I thought Anheuser Busch did a very good job packaging its charitable causes in a way that didn't feel like commercialism, as opposed to Hyundai and Dodge using MLK. And I really, honestly, thought the funniest thing was Jeep essentially trolling uh, Dodge. So Dodge uses the fancy speech from MLK. Um, it, be the best you can be. If you're a bush, be the best little bush you can be. If you're a tree, be the best tree. And then here comes the Jeep ad essentially trolling them with this. How many car ads have you seen with grandiose speeches over the years? Big declarations. Making claims to some overarching human truth. Companies call these commercials... Manifestos. There's your manifesto. I just uh, it, it shows the the jeep actually climbing up the the waterfall. I thought that was perfect, um, and, and it really, even though they're the same company, it felt like the jeep ad was trolling the Dodge ad. It really did. Um, also, that T-Mobile ad. We'll we'll get into these in just a second. Okay, I, I didn't like the T-Mobile ad last night. Uh, interesting use of Nirvana, though. Um, you remember this ad, I'm sure. Welcome to the world, little ones. Yeah, it's a lot to take in. But you come with open minds and the instinct that we are equal. Some people may see your differences and be... I just... Here's the thing. T-Mobile doesn't have fantastic national reception. And it ran an ad um, that was probably the most political of the ads. Although, oh, I can't believe you read politics. It was very clearly um, tolerance, diversity, and all of that. Um, social justice warrior nonsense. They ne- it was they never tried to sell their phone company. In a sense, this would have been a great Hyundai commercial for fighting childhood cancer as opposed to the, hey, uh, come buy our car and, and you can meet the people whose cancer you helped cure by buying our car, so be guilted into buying our car, hint, hint. Um, this would have been a better way to go about doing something like that. But T-Mobile couldn't sell their service, so they tried to sell the social justice warrior stuff. And I'm just, I'm so tired of the social justice warrior stuff. I really thought it was interesting at the beginning of the NFL season, the big controversy was taking a knee and was it a a protest against the flag? Was it a protest against cop brutality? Uh, Colin Kaepernick says it's against the flag. Others rewrote his words to try to claim it was just about police brutality when he meant it as more than that. Even he had to walk that back to some degree. Um, but then we end the Super Bowl last night with the quarterback for the Eagles, who, by the way, thought he was going to go off and be a preacher because he didn't think he was going to be successful in the NFL. And the coach of the Eagles, who nine years ago was a high school coach, um, both uh, praising God and thanking Jesus for the opportunity, not for winning, but for the opportunity to be able to play. Uh, quite quite an interesting contrast in the evolution of the sport over this past year from protest to Jesus. Uh, But still, I was glad most of the commercials last night downplayed the social justice warrior nonsense, but there were a few that still made it grating. A brief word on a new sponsor that I'm really excited about for the podcast, mancrates.com. Valentine's Day is coming up. You may want to get yourself something. You may need to get something for someone and you're not sure what to get them. Or you may be tired of the same crummy gifts every year and you want something really awesome. So redirect your significant other to mancrates.com. This isn't like the cheesy cologne sampler or whatnot. Mancrates 
has curated gift collections for every type of guy, whether it's sports or chef or outdoorsman. You can get the NFL barware crate. You can get the whiskey appreciation crate, or you can get the standard Valentine's gifts, but kicked up several notches, the beef jerky heart or the salami bouquet. All you got to do is go to mancrates.com, and they've got a huge selection of things. I actually got uh, custom pint glasses with my name on them for my bar. I have a great bar, bourbon and collection, and beer on tap, and these will go great. Chilled glasses for my beer. The crates even come with a crowbar. It's pretty cool. Thousands of five-star reviews. So what do you do? Go to mancrates.com slash Eric for 5% off. And remember, it's E-R-I-C-K, mancrates.com slash Eric. They don't offer a discount anywhere else, though. So you do have to go right now to mancrates.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, mancrates.com slash Eric, and you too can get the perfect gift for yourself, for someone else, or tell someone else to go to mancrates.com slash Eric for your Valentine's Day gift. Welcome back. It's Eric Erickson here. Um, I want to encourage you guys to do something. Um, you know, the, the reason I use all the texting codes and whatnot is I think it's easy for you guys to become activists. Uh, and many of you want to participate in politics. I hear this all the time from you guys, uh, that you want to participate in politics, try to make it easy. That's why, for example, if you text HOPE to 52886, you can uh, support great school choice legislation in Georgia. But that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I want to talk real quick about this cruise uh, that I'm taking my family on that I'd love for you guys to be able to come with me on. Uh, I have worked with the travel store. Uh, they are including uh, business class airfare, uh, transcontinental business class airfare on the price. They're including uh, the domestic airfare on the price. They're including a, a week-long cruise on a seven-star, all-luxury suite ship with uh, meals are included, Wi-Fi is included, uh, up to 40 excursions through France, Italy, Spain, uh, the Mediterranean islands. They're all included. Um, room services included. Everything. I mean, th- th- there are so many freebies in this trip. So many things included. Uh, they're willing to work with you on, on a package that's right for you. And I would love to see you guys. So many of you have been prayer warriors for my family. Um, you, you've been dedicated listeners of this program. In fact, today I saw that, that WSB is the only news talk station that was number one during the holiday book nationwide. Uh, the most listened to news talk station in the country. We continue to be because of you guys. And I would love for you all to spend time with my family uh, going through Europe on a fantastic ship, one of the best ships, cruise ships in the world. If you could and are willing and want to find out more, text the word cruise to three, four, five, three, four, five, and I'll send you back the link to the travel store where you can get all the information about the cruise. You can call them and work out a travel package. That's right for you. I would love for you guys to come. So text the word cruise to three, four, five, three, four, five, and I will talk to y'all tomorrow.